<laughs> hey, Cheese of Five community, I am so sorry. Something happened and Facebook just basically said, we've experienced a technical issue. We have stopped the broadcast and I had to restart it. So this is a completely different link now. And I am actually hoping it's broadcasting correctly. So um, we were just talking and addressing Popeye LaRue's question regards the need to take risk versus the ability to take risk. And Larry had mentioned that he recommends the book that he wrote called Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. It was published um, a couple of years ago, right? Yep, January yep. of 19 it came out. There are, yep. There'll be a new version published at the end of this year to update yes. because of the tax laws and stuff. And I had actually pasted it in our chat in our stream. Paul says that he bought hundreds of that book and he would like to a hundred. Okay. A hundred. Give away to people. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. And it's and, terrific. And uh, Peter says uh, it is back and we're working. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for telling me that. Okay. So uh, I am going to reshare that link to that book again uh, because it sounds like a fabulous book. Um, so Jennifer, maybe we just finish answering that question. So yes, we talked please. about the ability to take risk. There's a need to take risk, and that's how much return you need to get to your goal. So if you need to spend $100,000 a year and you have a $10 million portfolio, that's only 1%, you could put your money anywhere and you'll be perfectly fine. On the other hand, if you need an 8% return, you have virtually no chance of getting it or very low if you put it in the S&P, because the projected returns are only about five or maybe six, most people think. So you have to either lower your goals, save more, plan on working longer, or add riskier assets. Now, then there's the willingness to take risk, which is how much stomach acid you could take. Let me point out this, and this is the whole chapter right up front in the retirement book. There's uh -huh. a real challenge for investors today that Paul and I uh, didn't face and Rick didn't face. The return to the typical 60-40 portfolio over the last 35 years was over 10%. Uh, and over the 90 years, it's like eight and a half. But today with US stocks with an expected return, let's just round it to six, and bonds, safe bonds at one, let's say. And if you're 60, 40, well, you got four and a half, which is less than half of that, right? That's a real problem for people who have to adjust either, and it shouldn't be to take more risks necessarily. It may be plan on working longer, plan on moving to a lower cost of living area, uh, saving more, lowering your goals, for some people who have a good stable job, they're young and they can take risks, maybe they should do that. There's no right answer. You have to find the right answer for yourself. And that's what I hope I accomplish in that book is to guide people to that answer. And a good tool to use is a Monte Carlo simulator, which can only give you an estimate of your odds of success. It doesn't know what the actual odds are, but at least it gives you an unbiased estimate, not your own uh, opinions. Uh, but it's only as good as the estimates you put in for returns, of course. So you have to make sure you know what you're doing uh, and use a good program. Some of the programs out there are not good and we wouldn't use them. Mm. And, and, I, and I, Could I just add one thing to that, course. Jen, please? Uh, this is, is exactly where somebody like Rick's work comes uh, into, into play because these things, require so many moving parts in understanding somebody's personal situation that uh, an, an, an hourly person to solve that one problem is, uh, uh, is a, a really great way to do it for the little money it will likely cost to figure that out. And uh, kind of raise my fee this year, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and with that ringing endorsement. Uh, that is a really large cost at Rick Perry Church. Rick <laughs> is an absolute bargain. You're getting great value for 32 years of experience that he's giving you. So, yes. Well, I mean, uh, it's not enough. Right? Yeah, it just cracks well, me well, up. I, I, spend, I, I spend an awful lot of time trying to get to know the client first. I mean, we, we don't even talk about investing for the first hour. 
it, it, because it's not about investing. It's about meeting life goals and legacies. And, you know, it, it, investing is just a tool. I mean, the portfolio is just a tool to get you what you want. And, and no advisor can sit there and say, here's my model portfolios, pick one, or listen to you for five minutes and say, oh, you're 54 years old, you should be 54% in bonds and 46% in stocks because you're gonna do this age and bonds thing. This is absurd. I mean, that's not advising. Advising is right. keeping your mouth shut, asking some really mm -hmm. good questions to the clients and you know I mean, about their family. And you know what's like things that are really important, like how long did your parents live if they're still alive? And quite frankly, you know, what did they die of? Did they die of natural causes? I mean, these are the questions you got to get into to find out about a client. And, and I think that, you know, advising is not about the portfolio. It is in the end. That's what you're trying to get to. You're trying to get to a portfolio that'll help a person get to where they want to go. But, but advising is much, much more than that. And um, I think that advisors in, in general, I just, sometimes too quick to try to recommend a portfolio and hurry up. Is this the one? Okay, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and get your paperwork done and get the money in and get it under management and move on to the next person. It's just, you know, I think that what I've learned in my 30 something years and what I'm doing now is it really is uh, I, I'm very enjoyable now to be able to sit there and just find out about uh, people's lives. And, and then from there, you could start talking about, you know, their portfolio because you know, I, I know we talk about small value and, and and so forth, but that becomes quite frankly, and no offense, Paul, but that becomes quite <laughs> frankly I, I such a minor thing. I mean, it's such a you know minor thing in, in, in the whole big scheme of things. If in the yeah. whole big scheme of things, if we could show young investors how to make an extra half of one percent that will add another million dollars to their lifetime return on their investments. So I look at every, in fact, in my book, the 12 ways to add a million dollars, every one of those almost have to do with how could you possibly get another one half of 1%. So, you know, for do-it-yourself investors, particularly people who don't have a lot of money, I really am dedicated mm -hmm. to trying to figure out how can they get there and hopefully not have yeah. them bailing out at the wrong time. Well, I, I want to re regroup. I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, Paul, I think that title of that new book that you're talking about is actually We're Talking Millions, um, How to Supercharge Your Retirement or something like that. 12 right? Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. Your Retirement. Okay. So um, I have to admit that I understand where you're all coming from because I think I'm your ultimate client. I am a do-it-yourselfer. I'm part of the FI community, and uh, and so you know we tend to read and we try to absorb and we try to manage our own in the accumulation phase. So right now I'm a little bit into optimization. So and I have had a small cap value tilt in my portfolio for over uh, 15 years, and I'm sticking it out. There we go. And um, and that's the way it is. I look at it as a lifelong commitment. But I do think there are times when actually asking for a fiduciary, for an hourly advisor is worthwhile. Uh, it kills me uh, as, as you build a drawdown strategy five years from when you're pulling the trigger. But one of the things I don't think Larry knows is that we have a ton of people in our community who are going to wind up retiring at 30. 40, 35, 42, 45. I'm probably, I'm, I'm not going to be one of them, but you know, uh, but I, I really understand that mission of, of having people get off, get off on the right foot early. But I would say that I also agree wholeheartedly that it is the emotional and psychological biases that we have that we carry as we ride the roller coaster of a stock market. We ride the roller coaster of life. And I, I like uh, wood shedding you know, these problems or scenarios aloud. And you don't know what you don't know, having only seen an aspect of my life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do appreciate that. And I do understand the value of those. And I would recommend uh, that people start double checking their numbers as they get closer. But I also wanna make sure that you all know that, that I have folks in this community who are gonna be pulling the trigger. Chances are they are the, whether they just found us or they've been on the path, their goal is to be um, prodigious accumulators of wealth. Uh, 
as per um, the uh, Millionaire Next Door book yeah. that came out, if you will. And so they're going to try and become super savers. Um, and some of us aren't going to be in the 40%, 40, 50, 60, 75% savings rates. But the thing that kills me is that they just need to start investing. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer, yeah. one comment uh, that you touched on I mean, with these people who are going to be planning to retire early. Yeah. Actually, the first chapter in my retirement book, I think, is really the most important one. It's called Planning a Life in Retirement, because I don't know anyone who wants to retire from life. And too many people uh, don't plan and they have big problems. Um, people will be shocked maybe to learn the highest divorce rate co cohort is what's called silver divorces. <laughs> yes. I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. And now <laughs> and you're working together, together all the time. Together. I think we're, and yeah. if people don't have a purpose, what I call having uh, getting up in the morning and having two things. One, something to do that connects them socially. So they yeah. keep those connections of friends. Uh, and gets them out in the world and something that keeps them intellectually and emotionally satisfied. For Paul, it's all about helping education. Rick is doing the same kind of thing. I do the same thing through my writings. I could have retired 25 years ago. Uh, yeah. I had enough money, but this is my yeah. way of giving back and doing events you know, like this. Yeah. Uh, so you have to plan. I highly recommend, and I mention this in the book, um, and in fact, I love the book so much. I had him help me write the first chapter. There's a book called Your Retirement Quest. And I would urge anybody who's thinking of retirement within the next few years, that is an absolute must read. So uh, I and highly and recommend and it. In here, please. Um, sure, Rick. So I, I have a story about uh, a couple of a client. He and... Uh, his wife, they were both professionals. Uh, uh, he was an attorney, a very stressed, at a very stressful job. And she was a, a physician and she had a stressful job too. And they were in their um, early 50s and they both wanted to retire. Mm -hmm. So I asked, when somebody says that, I want to retire. When can I quit? I, 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 you know, do I have enough? Have I reached financial independence? I mean, what, what, what would it look like for us if we were able to retire? And my first question to, to them was, well, what are you going to do after you retire? And he said, I have absolutely no idea. And I said, wrong answer, wrong answer. If you don't know what you're going to do when you retire, don't retire. Now, she said, she piped up and she said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And she was into all of this organic farming and all this other stuff. I mean, she had a long laundry list. I said, she can retire. You, you can't retire. Not until you can say what she said. You have to, <laughs> it's like Larry, you have to have something to go to or it's just not going to be successful. Yeah, hey, Rick, uh, most people might be shocked to learn that the highest suicide rate, uh, if you ask them what cohort, I unfortunately lost my sister at a young age. I would have guessed young teenage girls, especially in this era of all the bullying and social media. But it's not. It's recently retired men. Yeah. It's the loss of identity. Yeah, it's a lot of purpose, it's a lot of focus. They lost the two things I mentioned, their social connections at work and their intellectual stimulation. Rick found pickleball. <laughs> and I want to see a matchup of the two of you head to head. Uh, on Rick's got all the medals. I'm just the tennis player who's learning pickleball. Uh, well, I might have to explore that. So um, Larry, Larry, Larry would play me pickleball graciously, but then I would have to get on a basketball court with him. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> Not at my age, Rick. I can get off. I played college basketball, but now I can get about that much off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, and that's actually one of the things that the FI community is really focused on is when you originally find this movement, it is my experience that people 
are running from their job or they're find, running from a circumstance that's not quite 100% fulfilled and they're looking for freedom and they're looking for other things. But once you get everything set in motion, your savings, your investment philosophy or policy statement and um, your uh, other mechanics set, it is going to be the why and where are you headed to that's going to be critical in keeping you on that path. And yes, while the mechanics are um, important, and your way your portfolio is designed. We all, okay, so the other thing you should know about this community is that we, a whole bunch of us are optimizers. And that's why we're interested in like, what's the perfect portfolio? So I love my community. And Don't do I that to yourself, please. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> and even I have struggled with that. And I have to admit, Paul, I about cringed. I think um, I read one of your early articles or one of your early podcasts, and it said something about chasing returns. I did that. And I probably shot myself in the foot. But um, so, you know, we have a wide range of people here. So uh, and unfortunately, Facebook ate all these wonderful questions. And I'm really sort of sad. Um, and I've invited people to continue to ask us questions if they're still here with us. We have about 57 of the original 300 roughly that were here. Uh, and uh, and and this both broadcasts, the one that was original and the one that was interrupted, will still remain available, hopefully, unless Facebook really tries to yank my chain uh, for uh, viewers to come back. The numbers just increased to 65 because they're now rediscovering the feed. So um, please ask your questions, folks. Jennifer, uh, can, I, can I just talk about your sure. comment? I mean, can I, I want to talk for a minute about the four levels of getting to investment nirvana. Okay. Oh, Nirvana. So, Nirvana. Investment Nirvana. Okay, you ready for this? Okay. Wait, so, wait. Okay, everyone, listen up. Nirvana. It sounds like Nirvana. a great book title, Rick. No, 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 no. This is actually part of my book. But it's, it's, I thought about Investment Nirvana, but didn't work. Maybe. Anyway, so the first level you, we all go through is called darkness. Darkness, which is we don't know what to do. We don't know who to listen to. You know, we watch Kramer on TV. Uh, we, uh, you know, go to the local uh, broker down the road. Uh, we listen to other people. That's how we make our investment decisions. We chase past performance. I mean, it's just darkness. The next step is called enlightenment. And enlightenment mm -hmm. is all about getting the philosophy, the philosophy of low fee, the philosophy of indexing, broad diversification, a lot of the concepts that we talked about here. <laughs> That's getting the philosophy. The light bulb goes on, the aha moment. I get it, the epiphany. But the next step, which you're in, Jennifer, is called complexity. And what complexity is all about is words like optimization. <laughs> okay. Where oh, he's you, got that you have the you have you have the big picture, but now you wanna find the perfect solution, the perfect portfolio. The fact is it doesn't exist. And when you realize it doesn't exist, you're gonna to get to the next level, which is called simplicity. And that's nirvana. So the fourth <laughs> level, simplicity is nirvana. And you just keep working at it, you'll get there. Well, you know, what's so funny is that I've actually streamlined some stuff and other than my 10% uh, uh, small cap value tilt, not a recommendation, just what I'm doing, it's entertainment only. Um, I actually really enjoyed one of your lines in, actually there were two quotes in the White Coat Investor podcast that the two of you, Rick and Paul did. Uh, one was, um, and I'm so bad at, at quoting directly, but one was asking, uh, I think Paul said something like, it's faith. You have to have faith. It's oh, faith in the uh, no, perhaps no, no. Can, We don't know what the future is, but we have faith in it. That's a great yes. quote by Paul. Great question. Yeah, so Paul Merriman, we don't know what the future entails or has, but we have faith in it. And the other quote that that really rang with me was from Rick. And it's, uh, I think it was episode 170, part two of the White Coat Investor podcast you, you two were on. And it was, complexity is a cost. Simplicity is alpha, is that's, an alpha. That's an alpha. And I, yeah, and I thought that was really pretty cool. Um, oh, and well, people well, are well, finding us. That, by the way, is, is, it, is it you can drive yourself crazy trying to find the optimal and you keep changing your portfolio, just like we've been discussing, you know, you yeah. all of a sudden you found this new thing you want to put in and then it doesn't work and you take it out and you go from here to there to there. And you're, you're, you're overcomplicating the portfolio. That's a cost yeah. to your portfolio. And, and well, it, just be simple with your strategy is actually creating an alpha, at least over 
that. Well, and also on the emotional bandwidth and the mental energy that you're expending in trying to micromanage your portfolio. And God knows I had spreadsheets galore at early <laughs> onset. So yes, I am probably, I'm headed to Nirvana and maybe I will become an enlightened soul. So we have some other questions that have popped into the feed that I'm dying to get your into, uh, inputs on. Okay, VK asks, oh, what are your thoughts on dividend investing versus growth and appreciating focus for the average investor? It's in the book. <laughs> There's a whole chapter I have in my retirement book, but it's uh, great. this is one of the, it says I'm on a mission to educate the world because almost all investors don't have a clue what dividends actually mean. Yeah. First of all, dividend policy, is totally irrelevant to stock returns. And that was written in a paper by Medigliani and Miller in the 1960s. And they said, it should not matter whether a company pays dividends or not. And it has never been challenged in 60 almost years. That tells you there's something uh, to it. Academics love to debate, they'll challenge everything. And no one has challenged that. The second thing I want everybody to understand is dividends are not income, except for income tax purposes. They're a return of your capital, not a return on your capital. When a company pays a dividend, the stock price drops by the amount of the dividend, unless you're one of those people who thinks a dollar isn't worth a dollar. In fact, there's some argument that would say it should go down by a bit more than a dollar because you've increased the financial leverage of the firm, reduced its cash, making it more risky. more risky. So there's a little bit of an argument, but that's on the margin, so I would ignore it. Now, dividends that are growing over a long period of time, constant, is not a bad strategy, but it has nothing to do with the dividends. You could have a company that has exactly the same characteristics, in terms of earnings growth, uh, balance sheet strength and everything else, and you'll get the same. This is called the quality factor. And there is well-documented in the literature for those of you who are the geeks on this call. I wrote a book, Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing. And that's what dividend growth strategies are. They're investing in higher quality stocks, which by the way, almost by definition, should mean you should expect lower returns because they're safer companies. Now, it hasn't turned out that way, those companies for various reasons, partly because their valuations have gone way up. Uh, and more recently, I've had great returns, uh, you know, more recently. But dividends should, in my opinion, be totally ignored, certainly should not be considered uh, as income and here's the other thing. They're a very tax inefficient way to get income. In other words, if you have a choice between two identical companies, one that pays dividends and one that doesn't, all else equal, you should definitely prefer the company who doesn't because if you get a dividend, the government taxes you on the entire amount of the dividend. If instead you sell a small number of shares equal to that dividend, you only pay a gain, a tax on if there is a gain. So yeah. a small portion, and it might be at a loss. You may not owe any tax. So dividends, in my view, should basically be ignored. Uh, although, as I said, they can be an indicator of a good company. The companies who are raising dividends are signaling things if you will. But here's the other thing. The number of companies paying dividends has collapsed. Uh, so you have a far smaller number and the payout ratios have come way down from where they used to be. Uh, and that's because companies have recognized that it's a tax inefficient way to give money to shareholders who don't want them. If you're intelligent, you're better off creating a self-dividend. This is my, I'm passionate about this because most people just don't understand how dividends there, work. And actually, uh, there are a few people in our in the FI community that likes a dividend investment portfolio. Paul, do you agree I, with Larry? No, I read I read Larry's book. 
So, <laughs> Rick. I can't argue with it. Okay, so Paul's not arguing with Larry's take, but Rick's got his hand up. Let's see what Rick's got. Now, uh, it's interesting with the low yields on bonds mm -hmm. that people are migrating more towards dividend paying stocks. I had Burton Malkiel, uh, the guy who wrote one of the first books basically on indexing, a random walk down Wall Street, Princeton uh, professor for I don't know how many years. Yeah. Friend of Jack Bogle, he was on the Vanguard uh, board of directors for decades. His view was that with falling interest rates and not being able to get the income that you need as a retiree from fixed income, that you should increase your equity exposure. So if you were doing 60-40, you should go to 75% equity. And that extra 15% should be in high dividend yielding stocks. He said this way, his view, now Larry, I know you might not agree with this, but his view was this way you don't have to sell stocks every quarter or so to get mm -hmm. the money because the companies are giving them, are, are, generating the dividend and paying it out, it goes into cash in your account and then you can take the money out. I thought, okay, that, that's logical. But the other thing is, I think what's going on also is, or at least it was going on until recently, is companies are getting aware of this, right? They're, they're becoming aware that people want dividends. And so I think that maybe companies are making different corporate capital decisions on whether to pay dividends or not based they, they, on low interest rates. Yeah, yeah. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, that, 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 those things are a lot. In my book, I provide uh, uh, a behavioral explanation for why people prefer dividends. This is one of the great puzzles in finance because everyone in finance in the academic side agrees dividends are irrelevant. So then they try to figure out why do people like dividends? And I provide the answer. We, it's not worth spending the time here. Anyone interested, you could read that in the chapter in the book. But it's like, I'm, it, it gives you this sense of, like you said, Rick, I got that cash, right? And I don't have to sell. Well, you know, selling a small amount of stock once a quarter or whatever to get you that same cash flow is more tax efficient. I agree. I'm willing to take that little effort to save the taxes. That's Paul's half a percent that makes yeah. you a millionaire. Oh, we're talking about taxes now, which gets back to what I talked about before, where you can make up that half a percent just with good tax policy. Tax so I wanted to, you know, finish up the conversation that Paul had on on that half a percent. I wanted to throw the yeah. tax thing in there, but you're absolutely right, Larry, is that if a company pays a dividend, you have to pay the tax on the entire dividend. If you sell some stock you have a cost basis in the stock. And so the amount of tax that you pay is only on the capital gain. So you're gonna pay less tax. Yeah, yeah. there is one other thing, Jennifer, a little tip for your DYIers out there. Today, the by far the best fixed income investment is something most I'm willing to bet I've never even heard of. Uh, they're MYGAs, which are basically CDs that are in the form of annuities. So they're mm -hmm. annuities with a maximum year of maturity. Yep. Uh, it's a maximum year guaranteed annuity. You can Google MYGA. Uh, I just have invested, look, today, five-year treasuries are yielding, I don't know, 30 basis points, 40, 50, whatever that number is. And five-year munis are probably like 30 or 40 basis points. And maybe you could get 1% maybe on a CD. I got a five-year MYGA covered fully by the state guarantee of an insurance pool if the company were to go bankrupt, but it's uh -huh. an A-rated company. And I got 2.9%. Um, so now you, know, you have the, to do it yourself, with and the paperwork is incredibly burdensome. So I have to warn you about that. But if you're willing to put in the time, that seems to be to me worth it if you have the time to yeah. pick up almost maybe another 2%. Yep. So and, and Larry, also, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of what Larry just said, you could actually buy secondary ones 
for people who want to sell. Like you can get spread. No, no, but you know, you just said a a what is an equivalent of a four letter word in the FI space, and that's annuity. Yeah. And so but this um, is the good kind. There are no fees, no expenses. Uh, no fees, no expenses. Is you're, you're buying, you're if buying you want to withdraw early, then there's uh -huh. a penalty. So you don't want to put all your assets there, but almost everybody could take some portion of their assets. You build the ladder of them. You could build by a one year or two year or all the way out to 10 years and have a certain amount of money coming in regularly and pick uh -huh. up much more yield. Now you have to be willing to spend the time to do this. And I urge everybody do not exceed the state guarantee limit. It oh God, no. For every state. <laughs> Because that's yeah. like the equivalent of FDIC insurance. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, now you've now Larry's just giving me new homework to look into and play <laughs> because you know I'm a dabbler at heart. Thanks, Larry. Um, we have uh, VK asks another question, which is based on input to maintain a strategy long term. What would you recommend is the threshold that indicates that one is one trying to improve their strategy should sell off holdings to merge them into a new strategy. The alternative to this would be to maintain holdings you no longer contribute to long term as you start investing others so what would how would you gauge as you move from one strategy to another i know what i did i i just slowly over time just moved my assets and changed things um but you know maybe that wasn't the best way to deal with it paul what would you recommend well, are we let, talking about in a taxable account or a tax deferred let's i'm going to assume since this person's in the fi space that we're talking about their tax advantaged account let's say it's a traditional 401k well then then we're talking about being able to make the move without any tax consideration mm -hmm. so if in fact it really is a, a better strategy i would not know why for example when people will roll out of a of a 401k plan Mm -hmm. uh, and they've had a series of investments there and they come in to a, into a, their own uh, IRA where they control it. Uh, the question is, they'll say, well, should I dollar cost average in? My view was always that if you were 60-40 in the 401k and that's what the appropriate, then, then you invest the 60-40 uh, immediately, immediately. Mm -hmm. because that's the right, that's evidently what you should have. Uh, if it gets more complex tax-wise uh, than that, that's that then requires some analysis. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Rick, you have, definitely have to consider the tax impact because yeah. let's say you think another strategy will get you 1% more returns over your lifetime, but if you had to pay 10% tax, I probably wouldn't do it. And yeah. the other hand, if I had to pay 3% tax, that's a 33% return, but it's a, not a risk-free return, right? Because I don't, that 1% extra is not a guarantee. So you have to evaluate the risk versus the cost and make those decisions. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, I, I, we did miss something I wanted to touch on because Paul had uh, talked about uh, retirement uh, accounts where you have these target dates. So uh -huh. one, I want to mention a few things about them. You have to be very careful. You can go to five different firms, uh, Templeton, Vanguard, whoever, and you'll have totally different asset allocations. They'll have different international US, different equity to bonds. So just because something is your retirement age does not mean it's right for you. That's number one. Number two, it's not an issue if all your money is in your retirement account because you don't have a tax issue. But if you do have money uh, in, say, a taxable account, you don't, for many investors who are in the higher brackets, you shouldn't be owning likely bonds. You could be owning, or at least taxable bonds, you would might want to own municipal bonds, except in this current environment. And also, in most cases, you're almost always better off where you are willing to spend the time buying CDs instead of bond funds. You save the expenses, and typically there's some dumb bank paying some crazy rate. 
And as long as you stay within the FDIC limits, you can pick up a little, and then you have to track it, of course, and it's got complexity and reinvest. So bond funds have some advantages and you can't buy CDs in most retirement plans. Uh, but there are some negatives about these retirement plans that you really need to be aware of. One is the asset location issue. Uh, most of the time you want to hold their equities and your, if they're tax efficient, like Paul, Rick, and I all recommend, then hold them in your taxable account, own your bonds in your tax advantage. But if your assets are in your taxable account, you don't want those taxable bonds unless you're in a very low bracket there. So those are important points for people to think about if they're interested. Now they do have a good benefit, which is that discipline of keeping you rebalanced. You don't have to do it uh, and it'll move you towards your target in a somewhat logical way. And we know that discipline, as we all agreed, is far more important. And we know that people tend to be more disciplined inside their retirement accounts. So mm -hmm. holding it there is, now that is an advantage. And if you're somebody who could benefit from that, that might trump the issues I've raised. Yeah, I, I wanted to bring this one question up um, from Vin Frank. I actually told the community that we'd take some questions from them and I've been neglectful of my responsibilities as a host. Uh, Frank asks, can Rick tell us about his recent decision to put some of his personal portfolio into preferred stocks? And then can we have Larry and Paul comment on the use of preferred stocks in a retirement portfolio? Well, it's not a recent decision. I mean, I used to manage preferred stock portfolios for many years. So I've, I've really understood the, the preferred stock marketplace. So preferred stocks sit on the balance sheet of a company as equity but it pays a consistent dividend, high dividend yield. The stock doesn't go up in value like a common equity because it's really more like a bond and these things can be like 50 year maturity preferreds, but they're used a lot by banks, they, uh, money center banks like uh, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, um, Goldman Sachs and so forth. They, they can't take on a lot of debt because they do have this regulatory environment in which they work in and they don't want to issue stock i mean jp morgan and jamie diamond doesn't want to dilute shareholder value by issuing stock common stock so they can't take on debt they don't want to issue more common stock when they need capital so they do this thing in the middle it's a hybrid they do it a preferred stock which is common stock it pays a it, it's a it's preferred stock it, it pays a high dividend like five and a half percent but it's after the earnings are are now so it doesn't come pre earnings so it doesn't hurt the earnings mm -hmm. now the interesting thing about a preferred stock dividend is that it is most of the time it's a tax uh, it's a qualified dividend so that if it's in a taxable account you're only going to pay capital gain tax on the dividend which is different than paying ordinary income mm -hmm. on a on, on the same company's bond okay but on the pecking structure it's it's it doesn't have as, as high uh, on the pecking order as bonds, but it's not as low as common equity. And normally companies, they have to cut out the whole common equity dividend before they cut out their preferred dividend. There's a lot of things that go into preferreds. Anyway, so I used to manage preferred stock portfolios for many, many years. And uh, they have come out with uh, more recently uh, index funds that cover preferred stocks. So I personally have 20% of my fixed income allocation in my taxable account in preferred stock. So I've got 80% in municipal bonds, as Larry was talking about, and I have 20% in preferred stock. And together, that actually gets my yield on an after-tax basis up to about 2%, <laughs> which is the inflation rate that the Federal Reserve is going for. So um, yes, that's why I own preferreds. But I don't talk about it very much because it's a, it's a complicated. Yeah. So much for simplicity, Rick. <laughs> I'm just going to tease you about it's that. Simple for me. <laughs> it's simple for me. I just use an index fund. That's all. I, I use an index fund. And right. uh, so it's simple. Uh, Paul, what are your thoughts on that strategy? Yeah, you know, my All of my work is trying to simplify to the point that, that I'm addressing one person in a sense. 
uh -huh. uh, and and so I keep everything dirt simple and don't do anything that would be considered uh, complex or or an alternative investment. Uh, just baseline information on things that I think people will understand. But uh, but I understand that that it, that many of us do hunt for a little extra return, uh, and uh, we actually have a. Uh, I've had a portfolio on our site called the Vanguard Monthly Income Portfolio, uh, which is a combination of short-term investment-grade corporate, uh, intermediate-term, some Ginnie Mae, and some high-yield, 25% each, and uh, has actually been a very fine uh, monthly kind of fixed income combination. Hmm. Interesting. Larry, what do you think of Rick's strategy? This is one of those things, as Rick said, Rick and I agree, and as you can tell, I'm probably 98% of things. <laughs> this is one I would tell, unless you're an expert like Rick, you shouldn't touch preferreds because most people will not understand that they are not substitutes for safe fixed income. You get an 08 or you know a COVID crisis, those things could drop 25%. Well, they did. Uh, and they did. It can they, happen. They did. Rick they understands have. that. He is willing to take that risk for the extra yield. So for him, it's okay. I think, you know, for the average investor, I think they should take their risks basically on the equity side. Keep your bonds safe. You want a little more yield, go for illiquidity premiums because you don't need all of your money at once. So for you, that illiquidity is a free lunch. Like with the MYGAs, you're illiquid for that term, mm -hmm. but you don't need that money, right? That's why I'm willing to take, Rick could take 20% and he could get 2.9%. Now it's not five, but it would be a lot more stable. And that's a choice he would have to make. He could still think, all right, that five is worth the risk premium. Mm -hmm. So for the average person, I wouldn't do it. Uh, for if you're an expert and can, you know, understand all these issues, and Rick certainly does, that's okay. Yeah, I don't talk about preferreds often unless somebody asks me about them. I mean, I don't talk about it with clients. It's mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, I do it because I understand it, but I think it's too complicated to. Mm -hmm to try to get a client to understand it because when it does drop 25%, like Larry said, it did in, in 2007, 2008, they, they fell more than 25%, I think. So, uh, but they come back because the, you know, these banks have to make up that dividend. And, uh, and so, but it, so it's a complicated asset class. And if you don't understand it, don't do it. Yeah. What it, what it means is Rick's portfolio is subject to larger drawdowns than if he kept it in safer bonds. Now he's getting a risk premium for that. So what that means is, let's say Rick decides he can't take more than a 15% drawdown in his entire portfolio. Yeah. And if adding 20% to his fixed income is in preferreds and that creates the risk of exceeding that 15, he shouldn't do it. If it stays within that 15, okay, it's no different. He might even say, I'm gonna lower my equity allocation so I could take the more risk here because the preferreds are less risky than stocks. And I only think the s and is going to get five. I got five on these much safer preferreds. Mm -hmm. You know, that might be a reason, another strategy one could consider. But oh, this, more this things for me to look at. Out. This <laughs> is not, I think, for the average investor. Right. I'll keep that in mind. So uh, let's not focus on that too much for now. Um, okay, you gentlemen have been incredibly awesome. It is about two hours into our feed with the interruption. Um, do you want to take one last question? And I don't know if you can see the questions that are on the right-hand side of your browser window for Be Live. Is there one that we haven't addressed? Uh, there's a question for Paul uh, about small cap value. Uh, is there a question there on the right hand side that you guys would like to address? And then um, towards the end, I would love to give each of you an opportunity to uh, talk about your next projects and where people can find you. Um, uh, again, 
and uh yeah, let's, and go for it. let's talk about that rather than small cap value yeah oh, <laughs> oh, God. wait 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 you yeah, know i feel so bad to wrap up. it's getting late here yeah. it is yeah. getting up okay yeah, let's, let's okay go. okay let's wrap, wrap it up then hey paul what's going on with uh merriman financial education foundation and what's next for you well got a new book coming out as i mentioned before and uh that's probably uh that's most of my effort right now is focusing on that. And we have had uh, a great time building this information on the four fund strategy for people who were looking for a simple way to invest and, uh, and go beyond the S and P 500 and the total market. Those two things are uh, take up most of our time. Mm -hmm. I still write articles on a regular basis at market watch. Absolutely. Fact, I also, I, I will say the biggest article response I've ever had came in an article and uh, that talked about how to pay for 10 years of retirement with $3,650. Anybody have any idea how you could do that? Huh? You front load that in small cap value at the birth of a child. Well, as, as, as a matter, do I get a gold ribbon? matter of fact, what you do, yes, you take for 10 years, $365 a year for 10 years. You put it aside for the kid when he's 67, 68, 69, 70, 71. And you even build a portfolio of big, small, value, growth, U.S. international. Amazing response. I'm sure people I have no idea what the article was about when they opened it. No, they were really hoping that for that one time short term yeah. <laughs> investment, yeah. they could get it all. I also want to make sure you guys, I was lucky enough to attend Paul's um, virtual event for AAII that did the comparison of the portfolio. Paul has posted that on his website, actually on his YouTube channel. I'll post it in the comments at the end when all the guys are gone. But I just want to make sure you guys knew that the, he has all sorts of cool stuff going on. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I know is that you have another AAII event, but it's not you. It's Chris Pedersen Correct. on October 21st. 21st. Yeah. And nope. Chris yes. Pedersen yeah, is going to talk about his two funds for life strategy, which is a target date Correct. fund and a smart cap value in terms of simplicity and um, its returns. And he's going to talk about withdrawal strategies. So those of you in the audience who actually had questions about withdrawal strategies, that might actually be an event that you might want to tune into. Um, so thank you so much, Paul, for your thank time and you. hooking me up with Larry. I, I so appreciate that. Larry, um, what's next for you? I know that you had your uh, second edition of, um, oh my gosh, the title just blew out of my head. Alpha. Yes, that was just released in August and that it had rave reviews. So, um, and then you mentioned you have a second edition of your retirement book coming yeah, the out. The plan is every two years because the tax laws change uh, that frequently. So we're updating that book. We finished that. It's now being, you know, typeset and all those good things. Should be out around Thanksgiving. Uh, the official publication date though is probably January 1 but I think it might be able on Amazon, maybe a bit before that. Then uh, I'm working on a new book, a favorite topic of my mind is one most of your listeners probably interested in. I don't think there's a good book on the academic research at all on this topic, which is ESG investing or Terrific. sustainable yes. investing. Yeah. So uh, my a good friend of mine, Sam Adams, who was uh, a key guy at Dimensional for a long time. He runs a sustainable investing real estate fund and well known on the speaker circuit. And I convinced him to join me and co-author a book. Uh, so uh, I've already written my two chapters. I'm waiting for Sam to finish his five. Uh, and so we're hoping that book will be out, say about nine months from now. That just depends yeah. on Sam. So I'm putting a little pressure on him. Uh, and now I'm also at the same time working on uh, my book, my personal favorite, because I think it helps individual investors more than any. I wrote a book called Wise Investing Made Simple, which yeah. had 27 tales to help enrich people's future, stories about cooking and gardening and movies and sports betting to help people understand these difficult subjects. There was even a, one of the stories on Kramer. <laughs> and why you shouldn't listen to him, uh, showing the evidence that his advice was worthless 
It actually had negative value if you acted on it. And he has one of the poorer track records among the forecasters. Uh, so that book is out of print. Uh, why, so why, why, why are you like saying that? I mean, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Larry. So oh. I'm operating that book, uh, and I'm working on that. Uh, I have to find a publisher to do that, but I'm hoping to. You, you know, so Larry, uh, I'm not just going to have to. projects of a book in one year, uh, you know, that's. Uh, and I'm going to do a pitch for Choose FI Publishing. So Choose FI is a media company. We have a publishing arm. We've already released um, three, four books total. Maybe I can introduce you to our uh, chief content officer yeah, I, at some point. Yeah, Harriman House, which has published my last few books, Darn has it. that proposal. If they uh, reject the book for whatever reason, you know, stay in touch, Jennifer, and I'm happy to work with you. At yeah. least, you know, begin a so where can people um, follow me? I write for four different websites. Uh, every Friday, Evidence-Based Investor uh, does a great job for the average uh, you know, retail investor. Uh, the people who run it are really all about education. They have a terrific site. I would encourage people to go there. Jonathan Clements, among others, writes regularly for them as well. Mm -hmm. I write also for Seeking Alpha. Uh, we have a whole series now on some of these tales that'll go into that book. Uh, and one of them is my favorite story about the big rocks in your life and why passive investing is the winning strategy in life and investing. Uh, I also write if you're a geek and want to know all about factors and that kind of stuff and the academic research, I write for Alpha Architect. And then I also write for Advisor Perspectives, which is really an industry uh, uh, publication, but I think anyone can access the material. So, or you can follow me at Twitter whenever I publish anything on any of the sites. It's just at Larry Swedro. And I will you know, tweet out that, hey, you can find this. Here's my latest article. And you can also follow him on LinkedIn. He does also reshare his articles on one there as well. One uh, thing uh, is that one of the benefits, uh, and I imagine the same is true of Rick and Paul, who are always generous with their time, is that uh, reading my books, my email address is in my books. I'm happy always to answer questions. I never go to bed at night without <laughs> checking emails and answering oh questions. Gosh. Uh, it may not, I may even be, I'll get to it tomorrow, but I do check and uh, that's how I've helped, I think, people all over the world that I'll never get to meet yeah. and I get all these lovely notes thanking me for how I've helped them. That's the reward. Uh, I don't do it because I'm not making any money. I'll never know these people, but, you yeah. know, the giver, you know, gets more than the receiver. That's, right. That's great. And I have to say, I'm excited about the um, ESG book that you're talking about. I would love, I can't wait for that book to come out. Uh, hey, Rick, how about you, Betty? Are you going to go smash somebody? Oh, pickleball? I, I'm, I'm going to go on the uh, senior tour here first, <laughs> That's first and foremost. Um, okay, the book I'm working on is called A Few Good Funds, The Genius of Simple Investing. And that little pyramid that I talked about from darkness to enlightenment to complexity to simplicity is the first part of the book. And I talk about the philosophy, strategy, and discipline uh, are the, really the three main parts of the book. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm working on that. I'll have that out next year. Uh, I'm also continuing to do the Bogleheads on Investing podcast. I've had a lot of great guests, as I've mentioned, including these two fine gentlemen. Uh, I have Cliff Asnes from AQR coming on next. And then I've got Roger Lowenstein, who wrote uh, The Making of an American Capitalist, which is about Buffett. Uh, and he wrote When Genius Failed, and he wrote a lot of other great books. And he's coming on uh, after that. So I got a lot of great guests coming up. Uh, also, I'd like to mention uh, for the Bogleheads and the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, uh, we are now starting what's called the Boglehead Speaker Series. And our first speaker is Carl Richards, who also uh, works with Larry. Behavioral and gap. There you go. Carl, Carl Richards, behavioral gap. Okay. Right. That's the guy. I'm sorry. I'm anyway, uh, so uh, it's going She's to be. Uh, uh, now, Rick. Say that again. She's for Clint. 
<laughs> I am. I'm totally verklempt. Oh, Carl Richards. Love his drawings. Love his little essays. Well, we're going to have time. him on. He's going to be our first uh, Boglehead speaker. This will be a video uh, conference. People can ask questions and such. And then uh, what, the next one, the next guest will be Dan Arley. He wrote uh, Predictably, <gasps> Predictably Irrational. Irrational. Yeah, right. he's a great author. I read all his stuff. Yeah, it's really good. He's going to be the second guest. So we're we're really expanding the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy and trying to put more good content out there. And that's at 501c3 Corporation, as you know. And, uh, you yeah, know, Rick, like, you I, can get Meyer Statman on. I'm sure he'd be uh, willing to speak. He's a great behavioral finance guy. I I have not reached out to him yet. I, this, the Bogle had speaker series even though i'm the president of this organization right now i actually have a committee that makes all these decisions so i, I try to keep things up on well, um, if, if you need a contact i'm good friends with Meyer. so okay thank you so much for that and uh so we've got a lot of things going on trying to you know continue to educate people as best we can and um you know con continue to move along and by the way i i'll also endorse larry's book one of his favorite books is the incredible shrinking alpha i think that was it's That's a great true. book. He just recently put up an article about it, right, Larry? I forgot where I read that article, but he gave a little synopsis of what that book was about. Yeah. And um, highly recommend. If you're not going to read the book, at least read the article. If you could say where it, where that article. Uh, would be. I don't right. even remember. I write on so many. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Seeking Alpha. I'm not sure, but the name of the book, The Incredible Shrinking Alpha, great book. It talks all yeah, about a review of the book. Uh, you could find that Advisor Perspectives uh, wrote a review. Adam Butler who's a money manager. So you could go there and that'll tell you about the book. It's a really thorough review summarizing the book. I don't yeah. know if you know this, but actually Paul also raved about your second edition, which is how I found out that you had a second edition. Yeah. It's terrific. In fact, I'm often asked, which Swed Row book do you recommend? And I say any. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. No, That's Paul, a second is, is, uh, uh, is retirement uh, book. I when I uh, had Larry on the Bogleheads on Investing podcast, we talked about the retirement book, and I got to read it before we uh, we did the interview, and it, it's an excellent book as well. Yes, and I'm actually sharing the links to uh, the Bogle uh, Center for Financial Literacy. Oh, I'll put on some other things, but um, thank you so much, gentlemen, for everything you, that you do for all the investors out there. I want you to know, I don't think I would have come this far without having picked up some of your knowledge in the interwebs. So I appreciate that. Um, thanks so much to the FI community for attending. If you found this at all helpful, please share these videos with your friends and family and other people who might be interested. I tried sharing all of my financial stuff with my friends and family. That didn't work out. This is why work. I came no, to the community. Yeah, yeah, I came to the community for this. Yeah, they're my friends and family. Um, okay, so um, thanks. Have a great night. Thank you so much for your generosity of time, and I wish you well on all your projects, and I hope we can reconnect soon. Great nice to see you guys. Thanks, Jen. Take care. All right, take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.